Good evening and welcome to InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Today is February 7th, 2012. We're already into the second month of 2012. I can't believe it. Got a big show coming up. Alex is going to interview with Mark Morano. So Alex will be doing half the show and I'll be doing this part right here. And uh, they're going to be talking about a host of things. Mark was recently accused of being a Taliban agent or something of that sort by other uh, climate conspiracy people. We're going to be talking about the TSA, a bunch of Ron Paul voting shenanigans going on in Nevada. But first, it's our first news, of course, is, uh, well, you know, Department of Homeland Security. Anybody who pays cash for anything could be a terrorist. Here's our headline, FBI, paying cash for a cup of coffee, a potential indicator of terrorist activity. And this is from Paul Joseph Watson. And they put out a bunch of flyers and they want people to be looking out for any type of mundane activity. And here's the quote, as we documented on numerous occasions, the federal government routinely characterizes mundane behavior as extremist activity or a potential indicator of terrorist intent. As part of its See Something, Say Something campaign, the DHS educates the public that generic activities performed by millions of people every day, including using a video camera, talking to police officers, wearing hoodies, driving vans, well, that's me, writing on a piece of paper, <laughs> That's me, too. Using a cell phone. That's me. And uh, our potential signs of terrorist activity. So I'm on three of those lists. Let's see what else they have. In fact, if you go to the article, you can see, uh, you can download a zip file of all the potential terrorist activities. One, of course, which is an internet cafe, but let's go to the first one. Construction sites financial institutions, general aviation airports, martial arts and paintball activities, military surplus stores, peroxide-based explosives, bulk fuel distributors, electronic stores, hotels and motels, there's internet cafe, buying your coffee, you're a terrorist, rental cars, <clears throat> farm supply stores, large retail and home improvement stores, shopping malls and entertainment facilities, rental properties, storage facilities. Uh-oh, here we go. Here's the big one. Here's who you know you're a terrorist. Tattoo shops. Uh, wholesale distributors of beauty and drug, airport service providers, dive and boat shops, hobby shops, mass transportation, rental trucks, people. If you breathe air or drink water, you might be a terrorist, according to the FBI. So they're going to have all these agents out there looking at everything you do, questioning you, making little snide remarks of, oh, why are you paying with cash and stuff like that. And it's just going to keep going and going and going. Please, go get the, article, get the, get the documents. Print them out. Read them for yourself. It's ridiculous. You're the terrorist out there. It's not Al-Qaeda. It's not Osama bin Laden with a bomb jacket. They're looking at you. And if you're in the military, they're definitely looking at you. Moving on. Senate passes bill allowing airports to evict TSA. Yay! Looks like a victory for us. The Senate has passed legislation that includes a provision allowing airports to replace TSA with private security, opening the door for the widely loathed federal agency to be marginalized from aviation security altogether. Following the massive nationwide black backlash against TSA's invasive groping policies and its use of radiation firing naked body scanners linked by many prestigious health bodies to cancer, an increasing number of airports have attempted to take responsibility for their own screening procedures by replacing TSA workers with privately hired personnel, and that's the way it should be. It should be free market because the thing with the TSA is you're not allowed to complain about what they do because if you do, you're either fined or you miss your flight or you're put on a no-fly list. So by doing it private, privately, at least you have the ability to complain to somebody and those complaints will be heard because those people actually care because they're getting paid for the job they do. It's not like with the TSA, they already have your money, so they don't care if you complain. One more TSA story. Mike Adams came out with this amazing uh, commercial. They, I guess they dug it up somewhere on the internet that the TSA is out there um, looking for, for pot-bellied pedophiles to join their ranks. And uh, so let's just go to the clip. 
Help wanted. The TSA needs your help to protect America's national security. As a lightly trained TSA officer, you'll get a plastic badge. Oh yeah, you rock. But that's not all. No education needed. No IQ too low. Not even yours. And as a federal TSA officer, you get to harass everyone around you, just like you did in high school. Yo, check this out. You also get to feel some genitals. No, not your own. So if you want your plastic badge, there's a, there's a job out there waiting for you, and they're hiring. So go check out the article at Natural News. TSA, Help Wanted Comedy Animation Video Causes ROFL Pandemic Across the Internet, C warned CDC. It's a satire piece, guys, but check it out. Pass it on to your friends, and <laughs> it's just plain funny. We're going to play the whole thing tomorrow night. Mike Adams will actually be hosting. He's going to give you the whole scoop behind the scenes, why they did it, how they did it, uh, the people involved in it, and whatnot. So that'll be tomorrow. We'll play the whole thing for you. Moving on. Ron Paul military donations, twice those of his GOP rivals and Obama combined. Oh, my goodness. Not a surprise because we've reported on this before in the third quarter, in the second quarter, back in 2008. And uh, from Business Wire, a veteran of the Cold War era, Paul raised more than $150,000 from active military in the fourth quarter. This comes after congressmen outraised all GOP candidates, including all GOPers combined, and President Obama. That was in the second and third quarters of last year. And, uh, and it also mentions that he did it in 2008. So what does that tell you? The people that are fighting your wars don't want to be fighting them if it's for the wrong reasons. They really don't want to be out there killing brown people and dirt farmers in other parts of the world. What they want to be doing is defending America from true enemies, foreign and domestic, which are a lot of the giant banks here in the United States. Moving on to Nevada. Paul Camp cries fraud over Nevada caucus results. And this is from the examiner.com. And um, this kind of goes with our whole saying of the, the media telling you Ron Paul can't win. And this is very interesting. It goes through a timetable. Let's go to the first quote, which takes place at 1.30 a.m. CNN and precinct captain revealed the results of the second count. This time, Ron Paul's count was roughly 183, 58% of the precinct's overall vote, to Mitt Romney's 45, New Gingrich's 20, and Santorum's 8. These are votes. <clears throat> if the media wasn't blacking out the coverage now, we could actually share these actual numbers with our readers. Paul supporters are ecstatic knowing that they won and overwhelmingly in a precinct of Jewish and extremely Christian voters, two of Paul's r worst demographics. In fact, CNN interest polls showed that Ron Paul won overwhelmingly among voters who weren't religious. Let's move on to 135. Your Arthur and thousands of others of Ron Paul supporters are still waiting to be able to do a simple math deduction that if Ron Paul won 58% of the vote in Clark County, and that was representative of his performance countywide, he should have won Nevada easily. If uh, he won 58% of the vote with 53% outstanding in that county, compared to Mitt Romney's 47, so it should have been a Ron Paul win, right? Well, at 145, CNN blacks out election coverage, shutting down the studio without so much as a word or explanation or warning, switching to human interest stories with an afternoon anchor for 10 minutes. The network shut all live coverage completely, opting instead to rebroadcast the entire night's early evening coverage where they were reporting on a Romney victory with merely 3% of the vote. So we have a clip. Somebody uh, shot this off YouTube, and this is basically the results of that particular caucus, which, of course, is not indicative of the rest of Nevada because those people completely didn't vote the way these people did. Here's the results. Be out. Uh, but here's what happened, Don. Here's the final count. 100, uh, 183 for Ron Paul, 61 for Mitt Romney, 57 for Newt Gingrich, and 16 for Rick Santorum. Behind me right now, these are Republican Party officials from Clark County. You can see the votes are right over there, right above those boxes. They're going to take them downtown to the party HQ, and they're going to be added to the county totals, and then, of course, they'll be added to the total totals for the state. So he's got an overwhelming win in this one precinct where he wasn't even supposed to be doing that good with Jewish and Catholic voters, yet the rest of Nevada magically votes for Mitt Romney. So old Mittens wins. And here's another interesting thing we found on a Facebook post. We'll go to this graph. And it shows the percentages of Ron Paul from 2008 to 2012. 
He's got a 120% increase in Iowa, a 210% increase in New Hampshire, a 385% increase in South Carolina, an 86% increase in Florida. Oh, in Nevada, only a 1.4% increase. And this is a place where, if you remember back in 2008, they actually shut down the primary because there were so many Ron Paul supporters there and they were wanting to vote Ron Paul in. They were wanting to give him the delegates, even though I think technically Mittens won the caucus, but Ron Paul had his people in. They went through the process and then it gets to the end and the Republican, the Republican establishment just shut it down. I think we have an article here over on the big screen. So here we are back in 2008. Ron Paul backers outmaneuver Nevada GOP establishment. Outmaneuvered by raucous G, uh, Ron Paul supporters, Nevada Republican Party leaders shut down their weekend state convention. And so then they went ahead and, and what they did was have it in a secret area and then gave it the vote to Minton's Romney. So that's the kind of stuff that's going to keep happening to Ron Paul over and over again as we go through. Now they're kind of predicting that Santorum is going to somehow win in Minnesota. Yeah, right. If you believe that. I got a bridge to nowhere in Alaska to sell you. Moving on to this weird, weird story out of Virginia. Judge sets trial date in Loughton School tardiness. And this has to do with Amy and Mark Denacor. They have to go to a full-blown trial to defend themselves um, for their daughter who's been late to school too often. This is elementary school. The Decores are each charged with Three class three misdemeanors, each of which carries a maximum $500 fine. Their three children, ages six, seven, and nine, have been late to school almost 30 times since September. Most of their tardies were three minutes or less. Well, I mean, what does that tell you? You can't have a robotic um, generation of people that are yes men and yes women who are going to pull the line for these giant corporations if they're three minutes late from school. That might, you might have to. Waste a bunch of people's time and money bringing them to trial, which is what they're doing here. We're actually trying to get Mark on the show today, and we think we're going to convince him. If you know Mark out there, tell him we're on his side. We want him on the show. It says here they're charged under the state's compulsory education law, which says parents have to send their kids to school for the same number of days and hours per day as school is in session. Another statute clearly spells out how school systems must proceed in the case of chronic absences when there's no indication that the pupil's parent is aware and supports the pupil's absence. Of course, none of it specifies tardiness. That's just another little glitch that they want to use to try to control people's lives. And it's disgusting. So, moving on. Last night, I uh, actually ran across this book, and it made me think of this book. Back in the late 90s, I think it was like 97 or 98, I went to this used bookstore uh, back in Murraysville, Pennsylvania, where I used to live. And I went upstairs, and I was looking around. I wanted to find some good books to read. I was sick and tired of reading the garbage they were telling me to read in high school, and I just started college. And I ran into, I went upstairs, and I found the conspiracy government section. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I started thumbing around, and these two books were sitting right next to each other. Grab the first one, None Dare Call It Conspiracy. Short book, I'm gonna read it. The next one, Who Runs Congress? I was already pretty aware in terms of uh, geopolitically that everything's been fixed, everything's a sham. So I wanna just go over these two books with you and I encourage you to read them. They're great books, even though they were both written in the 70s, early 70s, they're great primers and you will find many events in these books that kinda relate to what's going on today. So, let's go to None Dare Call It Conspiracy. They've got a lot of great uh, graphics and pictures in there that kind of explain the kind of overall global hierarchy. It goes into a little chart of, of uh, communism versus fascism, shows how the middle class are getting pressure from above and below, shows a whole chart of the world government and the companies involved, it shows members of the CFR including Eisenhower and the Kennedys and Kissinger and Nixon. Then we go to Paul Warburg who was the main guy